much for the lovely introduction and for having my colleague and friend, Professor Sharma, uh, kick things off. And uh, Dr. Patel, you and your colleagues, thank you so much for this invitation. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you. What I thought I would do, let me share my screen here, is tell you two of three stories on a journey uh, really related to what you heard from Professor Sharma about how we've taken on some interesting problems in nanoscience. And I want to tell you a little bit about how we got there. It wasn't my intention when I started my career. I was interested in how electronic structure and chemistry were coupled and that it turned out matched very well what we could do with a scanning tunneling microscope, which was actually invented during the time that I had my PhD, I was getting my PhD, but I was in a completely different field and didn't hear about it until I interviewed for postdocs uh, at uh, Bell Laboratories where, where I eventually uh, went to work. And so what I thought I'd do is uh, show you how developments that we put together for other purposes uh, turned out to be useful in uh, biology and medicine. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we got there. And really, these are uh, projects led by uh, three people who saw the utility of what we were doing to advance their scientific engineering and uh, medical uh, uh, work uh, towards their goals. And the first one who saw that was uh, Professor Ann Andrews, uh, my colleague in uh, neuroscience here. And then uh, Steve Jonas, who's on our pediatrics faculty, uh, who does bone marrow transplants uh, for children. And then we'll talk about a pharmacology colleague, H.R. Tseng, in capturing circulating tumor cells and exosomes uh, for uh, diagnostic purposes. I won't really have time to talk about the sensor work that's led by uh, Professor Andrews, but I'll, I'll show just one or two slides to, uh, to vector you uh, to hear about uh, what you're to read about uh, what she does and why. Okay. And so here I would say are the two uh, uh, most interesting uh, publications. Uh, this one was really where we took on the goal of listening and on chemical signaling in the brain that was part of the uh, brain initiative that actually together we helped develop for President Obama's administration and then uh, more recent work on measuring uh, phenylalanine uh, with the same sensing technology that we developed that we think is applicable across many fields. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, nanoscience and nanotechnology and why uh, nano plays such a key role in the world of science, engineering, and medicine. And uh, really that, that capability that we have came from an analysis of what we had done as a field. And it came as a surprise to us. Then in terms of uh, capturing, uh, interesting uh, bits that are sloughed off of, of tumors and uh, useful in other diagnostics. Uh, we'll talk about the work uh, with uh, Professor Tsang and also with Namjoon Cho at Nanyang Technological University. Uh, there are a host of other characters in each of these problems that we'll talk about as we go. And then uh, lastly, we'll talk about doing high throughput gene editing. Uh, we had a paper come out uh, about two weeks ago in PNAS that I think is the leading term in being able to do uh, safe, efficient, economical, high throughput cellular therapies for diseases like thalassemias and sickle cell, as well as for cancer immunotherapy. And we'll spend most of our time on that. And really this work is, uh, is driven by our clinical colleagues. All the, all the folks along here, as well as Steve, in their clinical lives do bone marrow transplantation for uh, children and adults. And so one of the advantages that we have at UCLA is that around one courtyard, we have all of science, engineering, and medicine. And I think it's the only place in the world with that proximity, with that high level of scholarship and medicine. And so we can work with, for instance, gene editing pioneer Don Cohn, right, who cured bubble boy disease, severe combined immune deficiency, and copy protocols from his lab and in all the diseases that we approach, 
we have colleagues who've spent years or more often decades going after them so that they have the model cells, the animal models, the patient cells, and ultimately we hope the patients. And so very much as you heard from Professor Sharma, instead of you know, making a cell turn green and publishing a paper, we're trying to work on the steepest gradient possible to get to patients and to figure out how to do that on a big scale such that it, those aren't treatments that could only be done you know, at, at UCLA for a patient who has a lot of money, but could actually be distributed around the world to uh, medical centers and, and indeed to doctor's offices. And so in addition to all our clinical colleagues or clinical scientist colleagues, we pull in the engineers we need on particular problems. And I'll show you a couple of examples of those as we go. Okay, now a little bit first of proselytizing and evangelism for nano. As you heard from Professor Sharma, that's a, a part of my brain and a part of my career and a part of what I try to do is say, why nano and what's important about nano. So a few years ago, at the 10th anniversary of the US National Nanotechnology Initiative, we were asked by the White House what it is that we've done with over a billion US dollars per year in funding for nano in our first 10 years and what we would do if that funding were to continue. So that seemed like an important question to answer. And we went and analyzed what, what we learned. And strangely, we found these two conflict, seemingly conflicting uh, uh, lessons that we learned. One is that we could make atomically precise structures and we could measure their properties. And there, is an interesting, there are many interesting reasons to do that. The other thing that we learned is that even when you have those atomically precise structures that, and you do a measurement of function on them over and over and over, and not even something that's identical, but even the very same one, that those, you get a different answer, that there's heterogeneity of function, and that turns out to be incredibly important. And we know it's important in places like biology where function will be contextual, right? The uh, a protein or enzyme or complex will respond differently according to what its cues are, but even all the fluctuations that are intrinsic to a, one specific structure, we think turn out to be important. Second, uh, we realized from our inspiration from the biotechnology revolution that the, the, one of the keys is targeting problems, again, as you heard from Professor Sharma, and figuring out what tools we needed to ask the right questions to go after those problems. And that, that, that technology development was a key to opening up not just our field, but we felt others. And uh, we addressed that in a piece that we wrote for ACS Nano with an interventional radiologist, uh, Rami Aklu, who was at Harvard and is now at the Mayo Clinic. Ali Khadim Husseini was at Harvard and moved to UCLA and now he has his own neighboring research institute in this patient-inspired engineering, and I'll refer you to that. But I would say our biggest surprise was that we had developed communication skills that other fields had not. And that we felt was because nano came from chemists getting together with physicists, getting together with engineers, getting together with toxicologists, getting together with ethicists, getting together with clinicians, getting together with uh, you know, people in electronics and so forth. And we had to teach each other language skills and we shared problems and we shared approaches and we developed new approaches together to address those problems. And we thought, well, if we did this, surely other fields must have done that too, but it turned out not to be the case. And I'll pick on neuroscience in particular because I married as a neuroscientist and work closely with one. Uh, you would think that the, the field of neuroscience would be welcoming to people from chemistry, physics, biology, medicine, engineering, data science, and so forth, but in fact, it's relatively closed. And nano has never had that problem. We've always had open arms for anyone who had an interesting problem. Uh, we tend to be curious people, and we tend to say, we can use you, come and, come and join us. And so 
I would say we have a role not just in nanoscience, but beyond looking at problems in other fields where we can help address those. And we wrote some of those ideas up uh, in these uh, papers here. Okay, we'll go on. So uh, nanoscience really got going when we realized that we were first able to image individual atoms when the scanning tunneling microscope was developed. There were actually techniques earlier than that, the field ion microscope and field emission microscope with also atomic resolution, but those weren't sufficiently broad, nor were the people in that field sufficiently welcoming, I would say, uh, to others to really have the same kind of impact to change how we think about the systems that we study. And to me, this was the most important STM image ever recorded. This was of a gallium arsenide 110 surface. And for the chemists out there, I teach uh, general you know, freshman chem first year chemistry. And so I can't stop teaching that. You'll remember that arsenic is to the right on the periodic table. So it's more electronegative. So in fact, on the surface, there's a charge transfer from the gallium atoms to the arsenic atoms. And so the empty orbitals sit on the gallium atoms and the filled orbitals sit on the arsenic atoms. And if we measure with our microscope, electrons tunneling into the surface, they have to go to empty orbitals. And if we just flip the direction of current and look at filled orbitals, then we'll see the arsenic atoms. And by overlaying those two images, Joe Strosio and Randy Feenster, then both at IBM, now at uh, their other institutions, were able to plot out not only where those two atoms were, but they were able to look at a surface as if they put on goggles and pretended they were an atom or a functional group on a molecule that looked for empty or filled orbitals, depending upon whether they were what chemists call nucleophilic or electrophilic. And it's a little more complicated than that, but it really showed us that we could look at a surface the way an atom or molecule looked at a surface. And that didn't turn out to be the end of the story with, these, with this microscope. Uh, what we also learned is that we could move atoms around. In my last four days at IBM, before I started at Penn State, uh, I'd given up on the uh, other experiments I was trying to do. And it turned out that Don Eigler, my mentor and I, both have the same favorite rear gas. And I don't know how many of you have favorite have favorite rare gases, but for us, it was both xenon. And he even had a dog named xenon at the time. Later, he had dogs named after other rare gases, but xenon was the one. And so we decided we would put xenon down on the surface and we showed first we could image it. And then uh, I wanted to figure out why the atoms were sitting out in the middle of a terrace. And so we rewrote the software for a microscope and showed that we could move the atoms around on the surface. Now, I didn't spell out IBM or do any graffiti. I was just interested in looking underneath them. But what that taught us is that we could build structures and we could manipulate atoms to make a precise structure. And so that opened up that world of, we should be able to make essentially anything that we want that is uh, sufficiently stable under the conditions uh, that we put it. Okay, so uh, when I, uh, started my independent career. Uh, as I said, I was interested in how electronic structure and chemistry were coupled, but I was also interested in how uh, molecules moved. So you might know that in us, we have molecular motors that are more than 99% efficiency at converting chemical energy to motion. And there's nothing humans make at any scale that comes anywhere close to that. And so we thought, well, if we built the right structures, molecular structures and assemblies, maybe we could reproduce what nature did and understand how that motion works. So we built a series of microscopes that could simultaneously measure structure, spectra, and function on the same atom or molecule or assembly tens and hundreds of thousands of times so that we get statistically significant measurements of function uh, while getting rid of the heterogeneity of molecules in different environments and so forth. And that's one of the places we learned about that intrinsic heterogeneity. And there's more to that story, but that's not really what I wanna talk about today. In order to place those molecules where we want them, where we wanted them, 
we developed the means to control the placement of chemical functionality from the submolecular scale, even designing hydrogen bonds to a tenth of an angstrom, all the way out to the centimeter scale, all at the same time through combinations of conventional, soft, and hybrid lithographies to self-assembly, to molecular and assembly design. And we got pretty good at that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we were really just pushing that uh, because of the, you know, our curiosity about these systems, the function of the molecules and assemblies as motors and switches. And in particular, one of the things we like to do was to put a molecule right at a defect in a monolayer so that it was a, in a controlled environment and we could control what the functionality of the molecules around it were. And if you see the movie Love Actually, it's already uh, late May. So in America, it's a, and uh, Europe, it's a Christmas movie. So late May is within oh, seven months of Christmas. So they start playing it about now. Uh, and you might know this uh, Bill Nye character who sings and dances and gets everybody to watch him while surrounded by this matrix. And that's basically what we're doing with our microscope tip is we're positioning it around the functional uh, assembly or molecule and we're tracking its behavior. And you know this, this microscope was developed by the late Heine Rohr and uh, Gert Binnig and Christoph Gerber uh, shown here at various uh, conferences with them. And so we developed the ability to place single molecules, pairs of molecules, clusters of molecules and lines of molecules by controlling the defects and controlling access to the substrate. And then we developed a whole series of, of new measurement tools that let us measure, for instance, the tilt angles of molecules, uh, their isolation, how tightly they were held. And then we developed various patterning tools so we could put different molecules in different places on the surface. Uh, we could, for instance, tether biomolecules and capture their partners from nature on the surface in that way, and then learn about their structures and function, and even identify them through a functionally directed proteomics. Okay, and so at about this time, uh, one of my colleagues, a neuroscientist, Professor Ian Andrews, uh, came in and said, you know, I have a use for that chemical patterning. She studies anxiety and depression, and so uh, what she wanted to do was take her favorite molecule, serotonin, and attach it to a surface and then develop a series of sensors that she could turn around and put in the brain and listen in on the chemical communication of live uh, behaving animals and decode how a neural circuit worked to understand what a thought is, what a memory is, the difference between function and malfunction in healthy and diseased brains or animal models of disease. And that really opened up the world to us for what the possibilities were. I'm not gonna tell the science part of the story, but I will tell you that together, uh, we had put together a nanoscience team uh, for the Obama White House that asked us to come up with a big problem that would capture the public attention and would justify the amount of money that was being put into nano. And this uh, committee, there are about eight of us, uh, was mostly physicists and engineers, but we basically said that the, there was this accidental coincidence that the scale of function in the brain, the synapse scale of uh, 10 to 20 nanometers was the same as the fabrication scale in the semiconductor industry. And that somehow we should take advantage of that and we should learn to listen in on chemical communication and the voltage, uh, you know, the electrical communication in the brain. And we actually fought over whether the chemical communication was important. Some of that in the literature, uh, Professor Andrews and I were on one side, physics and engineers said, well, the brain's a computer, measure the voltages, then you're done. Uh, it's not. And when the National Institutes of Health uh, came in and said, we wouldn't support this project unless you, know, you measure the chemistry and the chemical dynamics as well, everybody said, that's a good idea, let's do that. We published the technology roadmap for that initiative in ACS Nano. Uh, and then uh, turns out the night before it was announced, uh, President Obama changed the name. So there's not a perfect match between the title of the roadmap, which we're, we were required to publish before the announcement. It turns out you're not allowed to tell the government what to do. You can propose something. 
And so in our proposal, the name's a bit different than what he used, but we were honored to go to the White House for that announcement and hear him talk so passionately about science. There we go. And so uh, what I'd suggest is, you know, if you're interested in that, ask Professor Andrews to give a talk or have a look at those two papers I showed on the earlier slides. You know, I will tell you that very much as Professor Sharma mentioned, along the way we developed new technologies. One of those was a patterning tool so that we could chemically pattern down to now 10 molecules across uh, and do that for entire wafers. So we're able to print the devices that we can then use as sensors and we can functionalize them independently so that they'll be sensitive to different molecules. And I show some of that here. These can be transferred over to contact lenses, temporary tattoos, and so forth. And you can read about that in some of these papers. Okay. Uh, now, after the BRAIN initiative was announced, uh, there was another initiative called Precision Medicine that didn't get the same amount of attention. And that was, uh, the, there was an analysis basically to say, why did the BRAIN initiative really draw in different communities versus the Precision Medicine Initiative, which did not? And the White House Office of Science Technology Policy concluded that the difference was nanoscientists. And so they asked us to lead the third and final initiative, which was uh, the microbiome initiative, which you, know, you could argue is even less nano than the brain, right? Because you're measuring the ocean, you're measuring the air, you're measuring what's on and in us, uh, you're measuring what's in dirt and so forth. But really the skills we used in this were a little bit sensor technology and a lot communication skills. And that, that initiative continues to this day in the United States and around the world and at companies and other, other uh, interesting uh, communities. Now, we're gonna go back in time again uh, once we got pretty good at putting molecules where we wanted on solid surfaces, we were looking for some other challenges. And we said, well, what kinds of surfaces are important to control the placement of molecules? And we thought of cell membranes. We know that there is phase separation, there are pores, there are, there are interfaces, there are some enzymes, some lipases that'll sit in interfaces and chew up some of the lipids. And so we said, well, what tools would we need to measure where the molecules are? Because that was really key to learning to place molecules on flat solid surfaces where we wanted them. And the other thing we would need to do would be develop new tools to get the molecules to go where we wanted them. And so the first tool that we used to determine the placement was fluorescence microscopy. And these are giant unilamellar vesicles in which uh, there are two components and we can get them to phase separate by virtue of curvature. And that, that was by design. And so, you know, we uh, did this work, we published it in the Journal of Biological Physics. And the next year, uh, Watt Webb at Cornell uh, got much more beautiful images of essentially the same effect and published it in Nature. And this kind of thing kept happening to us. We have a rule in the laboratory that we can only do experiments other people can't. And so it seemed clear to me after a few years of this that other people were going to be doing this work that we should look uh, elsewhere. Uh, we did convince some colleagues also to work on this area with us. This was an early uh, SIMS experiment, secondary and mass spectrometry, uh, where it was shown that these, these uh, uh, bacteria when they hybridize also separate the placement of molecules. And Andy Ewing, who was the uh, uh, one of the senior authors on this project in our department had at the time, I uh, just published a very beautiful paper in the ACS Nano uh, uh, related to this. And then we developed a series of different ways before we stopped of controlling curvature. So we used optical trapping, we used micro pipette aspiration. And my favorite was this uh, encapsulation of microtubules, where in this giant unilamellar vesicle, we had very high curvature zero curvature along one dimension and you know, uh, uh, high curvature along another, negative curvature, normal curvature, all in one system. And actually the first paper that Professor Andrews and I published together was on this, where we 
used a radical trigger to show that we could make the microtubule uh, collapse uh, with that radical attack. And we're able to reproduce the morphology that's found in dying neurons in neurodegenerative diseases without the proteins that were thought to be necessary. We have the cover of PNAS, which if you look very closely on Big Bang Theory, the TV show, it's on the wall of Amy Fair Fowler's apartment. Part of the fun of being in Los Angeles. The last experiment that we did before we closed down this project was done by Susan Gilmore, a postdoc who's now at the National Institutes of Health. And what she wanted to do was understand what happened to red blood cells when they deformed going through capillaries, the, the constrictions of capillaries. So she recapitulated this cup shape of red blood cells in giant unilamellar vesicles, and she squeezed them, and she showed to our surprise, or she discovered to our surprise, the transient pores opened up in these, in these vesicles, and she could measure how long they were open, minutes and how big they were. And we had no idea what to do with that, but we figured hematologists, people who study blood would know. So we tried to publish it in their flagship journal. I'm a strong believer in publishing uh, papers in the right, you know, for the right audience. We sent it to them three times and three times it did not go out for review. So we published it in Journal of Physical Chemistry B and not too many people read it at the time. Fast forward several years, uh, Steve Jonas uh, was trained as an MD PhD. His PhD is in material science, but in his clinical work, he does bone marrow transplants, as I mentioned, for children with, with a leukemia and other, other uh, such diseases. And what I like to do when someone joins the group is they pitch a problem that they want to address. They don't have to have the solution, but what he pitched was that if you wanted to do a bone marrow transplant uh, on a child, 12 kilograms, you needed 1 billion cells. And the way that the gene editing has, it really is currently done in those systems is using viruses. Uh, that process takes uh, some months uh, for a patient in the US, it costs between 500,000 and $2 million per dose. And if we think about diseases like thalassemias with 300,000 patients per year, and sickle cell with another 300,000 patients per year, it's just not conceivable that we could treat patients that way. So sickle cell, for example, in the US uh, brings down the quality of life and life expectancy for the people who have it to about 40 years. In Africa, life expectancy is more like 10 years. In the US, you can get blood transfusions, but that ultimately leads to problems. So we're looking for simple, effective, safe ways, there's another problem with viruses, and that is they insert the DNA at a random position and can give the person receiving those cells uh, it's through insertional mutagenesis an, an unusual cancer that can then uh, kill the patient. And so the treatment is often not worth it, not just economically, but uh, for safety. So we're looking for other ways to do that uh, gene editing at high throughput. And we came up with six different methods all of which the first demonstrations worked within one week, which is very different than the microscopy that we work on where we have one experiment we've been doing for 30 years and we're getting close to making it work. And so Steve came in and as he finished his residency, he was given a special position at UCLA where he was guaranteed a faculty position on the other side of a postdoc. And so he brought in a whole slew of clinical collaborators to us and different diseases. And then we brought together uh, you know, powerhouses in nanoscience and nanotechnology and engi tissue engineering and acoustofluidics and so forth to address these problems. And so I'll show you a couple of the approaches that we took. I already mentioned the, uh, the um, uh, hemoglobin octase where hemoglobin is miscoded in thalassemias and sickle cell. There are also many immune deficiencies that have basically uh, uh, genetic errors that can be relatively simply corrected. All the same uh, uh, approaches that we're using also work for cancer immunotherapies, developing CAR T cells. And we work with Satira de Olvera, who runs our CAR T cell facility. And each time we develop a new tool, 
we applied on both sides, but I'll pretty much stick to the to the hematopoietic stem cell uh, side for the limited time that we have today. And so, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there's a single gene mutation uh, right now. Uh, the you know the the way to cure is bone marrow transplant, but that isn't really possible to do on uh, large numbers of uh, patients. Instead, one does uh, blood transfusions, and it's really a problem of carrying the oxygen uh, with the um, with the uncorrected hemoglobin. And one of the nice things about treating this disease is one needs only to remove 10 or 20 percent of the bone marrow, and then by intravenous injection of the corrected cells, those will go back and nest in the bone marrow, and that would be uh, that would be curative. So if we can do a billion cells in one hour, we could do that while the patient is in the doctor's office. And that's been our target. And as you'll see, we, we think we can do that. And so, you know, here's the basic idea. Collect the cells, isolate the hemopoietic stem cells, uh, correct them, and replace them. Yeah. Okay. So current technologies are the following. Uh, we mentioned uh, viral delivery. Uh, I think a university laboratory could do a single experiment in maybe 60, for maybe $60,000 on the cheap, but a commercial enterprise is a much larger, uh, much larger deal. And there are only three or four facilities in the United States that can do that now. <clears throat> One can also electrocute cells to blast holes in them, but that uh, has the problem that you kill a lot of the cells. And particularly for hemopoietic stem cells, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to uh, damage them. Uh, in that process. Uh, you can also use a chemical means of, of getting uh, payloads into the uh, cell, uh, but it turns out the efficiencies uh, vary so much that you have to you know, crank up the harshness to the point where again, uh, you've uh, damaged the cells too much. And then uh, there's a technique uh, that we're gonna talk about where uh, a group at MIT, uh, Langer, Anderson, and Jensen, uh, showed that if you made a constriction in a microfluidic channel, then when the cells squeeze through that channel, transient pores opened up. And that sounded familiar. And at that point we said, oh, that's what you do with it. But they had the problem that the channels clog very easily because of that constriction. So when we first posed the problem to the group, we said, how do you get the channels not to clog? We know we can use constrictions. And so we came up with coatings for the channels, omniphobic coatings, and a couple of different collaborations. This one with these slippery liquid infused pore surfaces had been developed by my colleague, Joanna Eisenberg at Harvard. And we started working with her uh, in coating the channels with lipids. Uh, we worked with Namjoon Cho, our collaborator at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And then another option was to confine the cells without constricting the channel. And for that, we use acoustic waves. And that's, I would say, the most successful technique so far, right? You can't, you can't clog a channel if it, doesn't, if it isn't constricted. <clears throat> and so instead, we control where the cells go using acoustics. And for that, we brought in the pioneer and leader in that field, Tony Jun Wong, who actually is a UCLA alumnus. And when he moved to Penn State, I was his mentor and had been introduced by Fraser Stoddard, the fellow who won the Nobel Prize for Molecular Motors, whose job I got when I moved to UCLA. And then we have some forms of physical penetration as well that I would say are more inspirational than I think will ultimately be uh, effective as treatments. Okay. Now I want to back up a little bit to how we know something about this. And this is from the work of Professor H.R. Tsang, who I mentioned earlier. So what he had done is he figured out a way to capture circulating tumor cells by using these spiky surfaces. It turns out circulating tumor cells are stickier than others. And so he developed what he called nano velcro. And he made these this essentially silica barbed wire by etching the surface and showed that he could do that capture. And then he could open up one of the cells and analyze what was in it. And he was doing very well at these lipid biopsies, better than the gold standard that the hospital had. And he had deals with various 
physicians where when a tumor came out, his students after you know, getting the uh, patient's approval could go you know, get some of the tumor and do these analyses to compare what had been in the blood to the tumor. Okay. And he realized that when he captured those cells that the, the uh, sharp barbed wire features were penetrating into them. And he said, well, if I do that, then maybe I can do delivery to those. And so he developed these supramolecular packages using host guest chemistry in order to put in some of the machinery that one would want to get in, such as CRISPR-Cas9 and the guide RNA and some of the special molecules that help those packages get all the way into the nucleus. So he had developed these already before we started uh, working with him. And we've used these generally as our payloads as well. And you can see here's that silica barbed wire with the payloads on them. And you know, one thing you may uh, you you know that's intuitive to us is it's easier to get onto barbed wire than it is to get off of it. And so while he was able to get the cells onto this, these uh, needles and deliver the payloads, he wasn't able to get the cells off intact. And that's where. A mechanical engineer in my group, uh, Xiaobin Zhu, who's now a professor at uh, Tongji University in Shanghai, had developed these lithography tools for studying plasmonics. Basically, what he wanted to do was make wedding cake structures like these, where on each of the layers, the icing was made out of metal. So he had rings that were separated by controlled heights that had controlled radii, and he could study how the electrons on the separated rings coupled. But he said, well, instead of using irregular spikes, what I can do is make very sharp regular needles across an entire wafer. And then that would give us a better opportunity, just like a sharp knife cuts very cleanly, right? Compared to a blunt knife uh, or a regular knife, uh, we have the idea that these would be able to penetrate and deliver the cells but also not do so much damage to the membrane that they would cause us problems on removal. And so we started on that. We took the microfluidics that we had available and we showed that we could do that uh, kind of transfection. Uh, let's spend more time though on what I think is going to go the furthest. And this is the acoustofluidic imaging. And this really runs in two different flavors. In one, we run cells down the middle of the channel and we use the acoustics to deform them mechanically. And in another, what we do is we bounce them off the walls of the chamber as shown here. So we can attach the payloads electrostatically to one wall and we use the acoustic waves just by changing the frequency, amplitude and, and waveform. Uh, we can bounce the cells. Uh, now, Los Angeles is a basketball town. Right, so it's as if we bounce the basketball to pass once off the floor, that's where we're doing on the channel walls. We pick up the payload and then the cells continue along the way. Initially, we thought that we might need to alternate between reloading the payloads and the cells, but it turned out we don't need to do that. And so we can run these at 12 million cells per channel per hour. And we've already gone up to 10 channels using the same source. 100 channels is basically a simple extension, and that gets us to our billion cell per hour uh, criterion. And that's a way that you can read about that in this paper that we just published. Now, uh, one of the important things is, do we get in the nucleus? Oh, and here's the showing we can bounce cells. Uh, are the cells still alive? What are efficiencies and so forth? And so we have a series of figures of merit for these cells. Uh, in order to understand if we got in the nucleus or not, this is an experiment that we do you know, in every, in every test. We uh, grabbed Steve Young, uh, who's in immunology at UCLA, whose specialty is a nuclear penetration and showed that indeed the payloads do get in the nucleus. Uh, we've done this with uh, peripheral uh, cell, blood mononuclear cells from humans, as well as human hematopoietic stem cells. So this was just our very first experiment, and we already showed that we were able to get on the order of 25% efficiency. We've gone a bit higher since then, but our viabilities are so high 
that if we needed to go to higher efficiencies, we'd e we could even run multiple rounds of this process and that would uh, give us enough cells to uh, treat a patient. And so uh, we've, this is, uh, we think very promising. Okay, and so the uh, idea here is, right, pull the cells out of a patient while they're in the office. We can uh, treat the cells and put them back while they're still there. Uh, in the other side of the laboratory where we try and capture uh, cells that are sloughed off of tumors, uh, we can do this analysis of you know, one in 10 or 100 million cells, uh, analogous to what I showed you from Professor Tseng's lab, we've now gotten better at that and we've come up with ways to do that, uh, to do that capture very efficiently. In addition to cells, there are vesicles called exosomes that also come off of tumors, tumors that are also useful in diagnostics, but you can't capture them on those sharp features. You have to come up with a more gentle net to prevent them from popping. And so uh, I'll just go through these last couple of slides to give you a general sense of what we do. Uh, we make these uniform structures. Uh, we develop the, the recognition elements based on what we know about biomarkers on the cells we're looking for based on a particular cancer. In this case, oops. In this case, it's a, a lung cancer. And then we use the chemistry that we know on the surface to be able to when we're ready to harvest a cell to be able to cut the connection and let it go and then collect it for even individual cell analyses. And we've done that for the circulating tumor cells and for a series of different cancers. And we've also now developed these uh, sort of softer capture uh, structures that are analogous to what we have in our intestines. Right? You have these villi and so we make a, essentially a forest into which we can capture the exosomes. And we use a similar chemistry so that we can capture the, the exosome that we think is related to the disease. And then when we're ready to let it go and to analyze even individual ones, uh, we're able to do that. And that was in this uh, the Applied Materials and Interfaces uh, journal that we published last year with more to come soon. Okay. And so this basic idea of combining chemistry, combining recognition, uh, we have some uh, of these uh, special cells where we know a lot about the biomarkers exposed on their surfaces. And so there are some model cancers uh, where we can work, but more of those markers will be discovered and more recognition elements become available. So we can use the ones we have as model systems in order to do those, those uh, experiments for capture. Uh, we're doing a similar work in viruses uh, under the leadership of Nam Jin Cho. Okay, so we went from moving atoms around to getting molecules where we wanted them on surfaces to looking around us at who we thought had interesting and important problems in uh, neuroscience, in oncology, in actually in dentistry. I didn't get to tell you about our tissue engineering work. Along the way, we've picked up people who are specialists in molecular recognition uh, and in pharmacology and diagnosis. And you know, really, it's, it's shown how if you expose curious people to interesting problems and when you have the ability to contribute, you can really make some headway. And you know, I'll point out very much along the lines, again, of what uh, uh, Professor Sharma said at the start, you're seeing the successes here, right? The world looks at your successes. We have many, many, many failures along the way. And so, you know, we don't go in the lab and everything works. We go in the lab and a few things work and we pursue them and then we get to talk about them. But we're taking, you know, many shots on goal and using what we learn to advance the field. So, you know, don't think people walk in the lab and you know, everything works. When I was getting my PhD, I didn't get my first piece of data until four years in. And I was the junior student on the project. I had to get the senior student his data and get him out the door before I could work on my thesis. And so it's a very uneven route along the way. And 
don't think anybody has this, you know, uh, steep ascent, you know, up a mountain. It just doesn't work like that. We fall off cliffs all the time. We trip things, you know, you saw that we abandoned a project that turned out to be, I think, one of the most important things we're doing now. And it's just by luck that we ran into, you know, and we're able to retain Steve Jonas to say, oh, well, here's what you do with that capability that you built. You didn't even know what you had. And so it's really important to keep your eyes open as well as you go through. And we'll talk about that more a little bit at the end. I try to put everyone's name on every slide. We have collaborators around the world. Uh, the people who paid for this work are largely Department of Energy, NIH, NSF, the Kavli Foundation, and the Keck Foundation. And then all these other foundations that came in and trusted us when we had crazy ideas and no data. So all these pediatric cancer foundations, for instance, uh, local companies. And uh, since then, uh, Steve has gotten this NIH Director's Award called Early Independence, one of only 13 in the country. And uh, Professor Andrews got this uh, other Director's Award. I think there were either six or eight in the country uh, that year on her work uh, trying to understand the brain. So it's been a real honor to work with these uh, driven people who can expose us to problems and let us go after them. And so let me just end with that and uh, describe how we look at the world. And this is something that especially the students and postdocs out there, but also some of the junior faculty, I think want to be thinking about, you want to find a problem where you can't wait to get out of bed in the morning to go after it. And even if it takes you time to get to where you can make the least dent, that'll be time well spent. I think it's really you know, interesting and exciting, and particularly for nanoscience to put together these teams of scientists and engineers and the people who are curious and want to work and talk together will self-select. And so look around your university, you're building a new place right, at our, at our host uh, institution today. And so you have a chance to hire people who are like this as well, you know, work on your language skills, share what you care about, right? One of the things you can do is recruit other people to your problems and let yourself be recruited to theirs. Everything I showed you after the first few slides was other people's problems where we thought we could make some headway, you know, bring in new people as you need them. If someone can't contribute, don't force them, you know, let them find something else. And then whether you succeed or not, that training of searching out difficult, you know, they don't necessarily have to be refractory, unsolved is good enough, right? You heard about the respirators in India, same here. You know, we were making some parts for respirators to try and expand our, our local capabilities. And, you know, wherever you are, there are interesting and important problems. And really, you know, what we've seen over the last few months is people taking on the problems that are in front of them. And that actually amplifies your creativity. And so I think that's something we can do when we're not quarantined and that we've tried to do. Uh, and really it's what drew me to, to UCLA was I thought there would be lots of interesting and important and, and some are hard and some are not so hard problems to go after. And so that's how I enjoy spending my day and what gets me out of bed in the morning. So thank you so much to Dr. Patel and his team for setting this up and for inviting me to give uh, this talk, and I'll be uh, happy to uh, answer uh, questions. Thank you very much, Paul, for this wonderful talk. And uh, it is indeed motivational for many uh, researchers in their early stage uh, research career that uh, such a talk is organized and such a wonderful talk is given to them. Uh, I have, of course, uh, selected some questions from the uh, comment box. There are like more than 700 comments in our Facebook page. <laughs> Oh, no. uh, okay. during your talk <laughs> so uh, of course but i will try to select like two or three i will close and probably i will also allow the panel members to ask questions later if they have any uh, so one question is there from uh, mr lila dar sukhar that is nanotechnology useful in transferring brain signals to robots ah well i mean if you you know for instance if one is interested in prosthetics Right? Connecting, uh, if you want to do physical connections into the brain or into the devices, 
one could imagine doing that with nano. There are, you know, implants in a human brains now, I think something like 100,000 just around the U.S. for, you know, everything from cochlear implants to deep brain stimulation for uh, depression and other Parkinson's, other diseases. Those aren't necessarily nano, right? And there are also ways of not using physical connections, but using signals that we can output in our brain to have control. It may be on the robot side, the nano is, is at this point more interesting and useful, but certainly in terms of the brain initiative, we wanna get down to the cellular scale, which is microns, then we'll need nano components to be able to do that. Uh, next question is uh, from Mr. Bharat Dixit. That is Dr. Paul working to combat for COVID-19? Uh, we do think we have a way to use the uh, sensors that we develop uh, to look for uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, stratify uh, viruses and any future uh, diseases. So it is something that we're, we're trying to do in our laboratory Right now, the only activity is um, 3D printing for the hospital and clinical trials, but that isn't so much, you know, we, we changed some swab designs. It's still that. helping, I guess. <laughs> we're, not, we're doing our best to help in every way that we can. That's correct. Yeah. But right, I, think right, right, source, I think we have an idea that'll help us uh, address you know, the current and future uh, pandemics and infectious diseases that we'd like to Right. I'd like to develop. Okay. Uh, if there are any questions from the panel, then uh, I would request them to ask now. Otherwise, I can take a couple of more yeah. questions. Uh, uh, I have one question. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, my question is very general. Like, uh, suppose if you are uh, taking your uh, nanobody conjugate drug inside a, a specific part of a body, like a brain or somewhere, what is the flux mechanism? Like, how it is coming once it's done its job? from that part, like irritating tumor or something. And then like, because it's like a nanoparticle. So my thing is like, it's, it's still accumulating and staying that place or like how it is it getting is, it. Right. So yeah, I think that's, that's a good question. One of the things we have to worry about is the metabolism of yep. whatever it is uh, we put in. In fact, uh, there's a really wonderful description uh, by Mark Davis at Caltech uh, that he yeah. published in NAS of how uh, how he got a relatively simple particle uh, through regulation. Uh, he went to the FDA to be able to do trials in humans, and it was more than 60 volumes of data yeah. that he had to send in. In the you know in the end, that project did not succeed, but he he engineered the system backwards to simplify regulation. And even in that case where you knew what all the breakdown products were, the regulation was very difficult. So one of the things we worry about at the journal and in our collaborations is if you're trying to make a therapeutic, there has to be some chance that it gets through regulation. But we won't consider a paper, you know, if people just slap together all these different things and it, it's never gonna see a human uh, because while it looks cool in a paper, it can't possibly uh, get approval because of, you know, because of, you know, this one issue you mentioned, you know, and, and several others in terms of complication and manufacture and precision and so forth. And so all those aspects have to be considered whenever you think about nanomedicine, right? The most right. successful one in the world is uh, uh, called the Braxane. And one of my uh, colleagues here, uh, former colleague uh, who now owns the Los Angeles Times and part of the LA Lakers and so forth, basically took the leading anti-cancer drug Paxol and packaged it up in a protein nanoparticle. And the efficacy ended up about the same as the okay. normal formulation, but the side effects were so much lower that it made it very valuable. And that captured a third of the world's market of Taxol. So it became a multi-billion dollar drug yeah, interesting. Yeah. But it was very simple, right? It was really the, the yeah. packaging of the drug that it made it better for so much better for patients. Thank you.
And so, yeah, sometimes thinking simple <laughs> is very, very important. You know, and things that really work and have effect are often very simple things. They're not, you know, complex, complex, crazy machines. We couldn't agree more with you, Paul, <laughs> about that. So uh, are there any other questions from the uh, panel? Uh, OK, then uh, probably one last question uh, from the uh, audience. Uh, of course, there are many, many questions from them, but uh, I will only take the last one now, uh, which is very specific, actually. It is from Neha Shukla. So if the average size of nanoparticle is between 180 and 200 nanometer, with 0.15 PDI value, is it considered as nanoparticle, especially for cancer drug? Rules about uh, what's called a nanoparticle for drug purposes. I mean, I think something that's nanoscale, it's okay to call it nano. Uh, we tend to think of smaller, you know, uh, smaller particles, and there's some advantages. So, for instance. There are particles of a certain size that'll get stuck in the leaky vasculature of a tumor, right? And you can take advantage of that uh, in that you'll get extra, you know, extra delivery to the tumor without any smart coding or anything, just by virtue of the size. And so those are the kind of things you want to think about. You know, many uh, tumors also are slightly more acidic than their surroundings. And so you can make an acid sensitive particle those those kind of simple ideas might go further than saying you know okay i can make it over this 10 percent range uh, yeah all right so uh, i guess that's all for the question session and i would again like to thank you on behalf of uh, our organizing team uh, from the university and also from all the viewers they have posted very good comments about your uh, <laughs> talk uh, and I'm sure they will again watch it again and again on Facebook as it is available. Oh, very good. Maybe you can send them as well. <laughs> so thank you very much again for your time. Thank and for you the wonderful so much. Lecture. It was a great pleasure. <laughs> good luck with the rest of the conference. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.